Um, I'm really looking forward to announce the next guy on stage. You've seen, or some of you have seen him already. His name is uh, Tristan Pollock. Um, what he's going to talk about is how I did it and what I learned along the way. And he's learned a lot. He's the founder of Storefront, which is essentially, it's such an ingenious question, a thing he does. It's essentially like Airbnb, but for retail, which is so awesome that Forbes said, well, come along into 30 under 30 because you're awesome. And um, so he did that, and now he's entrepreneur in residence with 500 startups, and it gets to mentor startups, which is, I think, the best job in the world. Um, great guy. Make some noise for Tristan, please. Welcome on stage, Tristan. Hello, sir. Thanks. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> What's up, Sylvania? I heard I, someone, I was talking to a Sylvanian friend before I came out here. It's my first time here, and I was like, so he told me, he's like, Sylvania is like the land of rock and roll. So I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but I tried to give a little bit of rock and roll. Um, I also modified the name of my talk a bit because literally it's kind of like about how I literally got right here. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit uh, about my story, um, starting from when I was much younger, uh, and I'll go through a few lessons learned along the way, things that maybe are obvious to some people, but I think meant a lot in my upcoming. So again, this is me, uh, in case you didn't recognize me already, and I'm the co-founder of Storefront. Um, which is a marketplace for short-term retail space. We help makers, artists, and designers find physical retail space in cities um, in the US right now. Uh, but what's really compelling about it is that we're fusing tech with urban, innova urban innovation and city centers to really bring the create most creative people in the world into our cities. And so since we're at a startup event, um, I'll talk a little bit about our, uh, wh where we're at. Um, so we're two years old, um, which is about the same time and the amount of time I've lived in Silicon Valley, San Francisco. Um, we uh, have about uh, 20 people on our team right now, and uh, we've raised a little under $9 million. And the, this is the big one. Uh, we've opened over 1,000 stores last year in 2014, uh, which is makers, artists, designers, brands coming through our site and booking a space through a space owner. We're an open marketplace, and we just basically make that process much more streamlined and simple. If you think of kind of like a one, two, three step process, you're going from, I need to find this space, so where do I find it versus just walking the street, which is now storefront. Um, I need to rent it, uh, and before the real estate industry is very old, and you're probably still giving a paper check, signing a paper contract, we're digitalizing all of that, making it extremely fast to do. So when you're doing a short-term lease, which is anything from one day to six months, it's that much easier. And then third step, get your store set up. So, uh, as you probably know, I'm also part of 500 Startups. I'm an EIR with uh, the current uh, accelerator that actually just graduated, which is why we, we got here very late last night. Um, they had their demo day on Tuesday night, and uh, 33 companies pitched to about 800 investors in a room. So that's the excitement that you, I get to work with on a daily basis at 500, and it's really rewarding to be able to see, this, see my first accelerator all the way through uh, in four months. Um, a little bit about 500 is we've invested in over a thousand companies in less than five years. So my opinion, that makes us one of the most active venture capital firms in the world. Uh, we split that between a seed fund and an accelerator, and check size are usually 50 to 100K. Um, quick plug is uh, you should talk to myself or Dominic here in the first row if you are working on an early stage startup and would like to know more about 500 and our accelerator program. So, uh, on to the story. Uh, I did not grow up in Silicon Valley. And you don't need to. Uh, I think that's maybe one of the misconceptions is there are, it, San Francisco and Silicon Valley is one of the biggest uh, cities, in, I think, in at least, at least biggest tech cities for immigrants. Uh, national immigrants, international immigrants, and I'm one of them. I actually grew up at a place kind of like this. Uh, this is uh, Minnesota, uh, more specifically Minneapolis, and a uh, little bit different, a uh, little bit different climate than, than Silicon Valley, uh, where 
the, the temperature doesn't change too much. Um, but it's actually a really great city, and this is what kind of got me excited about some of the things I'm working on today uh, because of the influences that I was around. I grew up right outside the city uh, in, in the woods, and, but I always found myself coming back to the city for a lot of these things, art, music, um, design. Minneapolis is a great city for those things. And then I moved on and I, I went to school and I ended up splitting my school between Fargo, North Dakota uh, and Auckland, New Zealand. And so that kind of brings me to my second lesson was, you know, expand, expand your, your uh, preferences, expand, get into different cultures. I think that's a, it's been a huge impact in how, everything I think about today because you learn new things and you, and you open up your mind as you experience these different conversations and these different settings. Uh, and it really, I think that really kind of pushed me to the next level of, of starting to understand the world from a, a different place and a different perspective. And then after, after school, I did a variety of different things. Uh, I worked for a Fortune 500 company. Um, I worked on a lot of creative projects. Um, this is a stencil I did recently, so I still try to keep it going. Um, I'm from Scotland, so that's not obvious. Uh, five generations out. Uh, and, uh, and I do a lot of writing and photography, and the latest thing I want to do is more music. But uh, and going even before that, I, I did like 10 different internships in school because I was just so curious about trying different things out and really like figuring out the world from like a kind of a hands-on sort of perspective. I'm definitely someone who learns by doing. And so uh, this is a... I think a lesson you can use for just about everything in life, but test and try everything, double down on what works. Um, you don't want to test and try everything forever. Uh, you, want to, you want to find out what you're most passionate about or find out what you, at least is, you think is a good enough bet and then go for it. Uh, if you always stay distributed, you'll never go you know, down the rabbit hole on one idea and really see if it works. So, and along those lines, I think it's, it's, it's much it's much. Uh, more rewarding to actually put something all into it. It's risky and sometimes it can be scary, but when you put everything into something, uh, that focus really will pay off in one way or another and you're going to probably learn more than you ever have. The second lesson was from Best Buy where, and many of these internships uh, where I naturally, I didn't call these people mentors, but people that were older or more skilled or had more expertise than me uh, in these different roles, I, I formed a really strong bond with. And so I think mentorship is huge. Whether you formalize it or not, that sort of feedback, that sort of relationship can really go a long way. And I can still reach back out to some of my early mentors at Best Buy, even when I'm working on things with Storefront. So that kind of takes us a little bit further along here um, to my first uh, technical startup. Um, right after, a little bit during Best Buy and right after, I started working on this with my co-founder who I then moved on to found Storefront with. And uh, it was called Social Earth. Uh, we called it a Huffington Post for social entrepreneurship where we basically provided the world with news and resources around people doing some of, tackling some of the hardest problems in the world, social entrepreneurs. Um, it was really great to see that some spoke here today uh, because I think it's a very hard thing to do. And a lot of these people would dedicate their lives, their entirety of their lives, to trying to change a big issue. Um, and we didn't feel like those stories were being told enough. Uh, there was, you have the mainstream media in the United States is something that isn't really something to be proud of. You know, you watch the nightly news, it doesn't really talk about the people doing these, doing these things and, and the big challenges and solutions that are out there. Sometimes they're too complex, maybe they want more reality TV, uh, but that was a problem for us. And so now about six years ago is when we originally set out uh, and started Social Earth, which still lives on today. And uh, we, uh, it was acquired by a larger media company, um, as you see here, 3BL Media in Boston. And basically what they, what they appreciated about what we had built was the fact that we had, this, we had one of the most uh, uh, active media platforms in this niche, um, but also the community we had built around it. Um, the community and the content that uh, really inspired people on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So uh, that brings us to lesson number five. Um, surround yourself with people that are ambitious and have the same passions that you do, um, or even more so. Um, that's basically uh, what happened is, I, you know, I got connected to my co-founder with Social Earth uh, around a similar passion for social entrepreneurship. And then when, that, when we sold it to this other media company, we were like, okay, like what's next? I think we took like maybe a month off. And then uh, in the summer back in Minneapolis, we were like, okay, like what, what else is out there that we're both equally passionate about? Um, and, that, and that's basically what led us to Storefront. Um, and, and, and that's like, a, I think the, you know, one of the big things is like we were, we were looking at Storefront, we're like, okay, there's, there's some big, big issues out here in this space. It's very hard, you know, there's a reason why people call artists struggling artists. It's incredibly hard to do it, not that they're not talented or they went to the best design school, but that it's hard to find customers, it's hard to learn about all these distribution channels, you know, definitely like the creative mind is much different than a salesperson's mind. So I'll go into a little bit about Storefront and kind of ex walk through that trajectory of why we felt this was a huge problem and how we started to solve it and some of the trends that we see around it. And hopefully that's something you can take away into your own, own businesses and own ideas and, and walk through the similar process. So, uh, like I said, something I was incredibly passionate about, uh, we were makers for life. Uh, my parents were artists. They took me to my first uh, art fair uh, in Minneapolis. They took me to my first gallery opening. These short-term creative experiences really made something uh, really important in my life. And uh, this is a, a little uh, Michael Michelangelo that I did early on, maybe about age of five. So we really like believe in living and breathing what we do. One of the big problems that I saw and what really got me passionate about wanting to start this business was that there was a lot of gray space. Uh, if you think, if you look around, um, every day you're probably walking through a city that has gray walls, gray chain link fence, gray sidewalks, and it just, it's endless. And we didn't say that we wanted these things in our cities. The cities built up, they grew really fast, uh, if you've ever been to a city in China, you'll see some of this firsthand in it where entire cities have, are now vacant because they didn't plan and they didn't pro provide for the community. They didn't create a place for community. And it's, every city in the world is guilty of this, but I think it's something that we can all change. Whether you're working on uh, technology or you're working in art or you're a design student, there's all sorts of ways we can contribute to our, our communities and add a little bit more color to them. And along, along those lines, uh, one in 10 stores in the US is vacant. And that was true two years ago, and it's still true today. It's something that also got us really upset. We're like, we, you could walk down the best streets in San Francisco, the best streets in New York, the best streets in Minneapolis, and you would see that these vacant storefronts that look much like this. Sign on them, covered up the windows, maybe the windows are open, but like, that's not inspiring and you're walking by this every day. Uh, so we, we were like, there's a problem here because we have 28 million small businesses and entrepreneurs in the US, one sixth of which work in the creative industry alone. And they're not getting into these spaces. So what's so hard about it? Why is it so expensive? Why are some landlords sitting on spaces and not allowing anyone to rent them for like one, two, three years? And they're losing this money but there's, there's a line out the block of people that would rent that space and create something special about it. So we wanted to really change that. Now on the other hand, uh, we've also worked with much larger brands like Nike, Target, and Kanye West, uh, who opened up a pop-up shop with his own fashion brand in New York while he was on tour. So it's just another example of the, of the many applications that we started to see happening um, what a lot of people call pop-up shops uh, or pop-up stores or pop-in shops, um, we looked at it as short-term retail. And these are our experiences happening in cities. They could be an art festival in, in the city center. It could be a store. It could also be an established store or gallery that's looking to bring new brands in. 
So we want to provide those avenues, those outlets. Basically, it's like customer distribution in person in the physical real world. So there were three main trends that we saw uh, and that helped tell our story a little bit better when we started selling it to investors. Uh, so there's three economies uh, that are starting to play together and work in tandem. There's also the personal selling revolution, which is also very exciting for startups because it's never been easier to start a business. So many tools out there that will help you do that. And then retail being an experience. So I'll go through these, I'll go through the three economies first. You've probably heard of the sharing economy, collaborative consumption. Um, it's spelled out in a lot of different ways. Some people sh say it's sharing, some people say it's not sharing. Uh, but in the end of the day, we're, storefront positions itself in, in the B2B section of the sharing economy. So we're helping these businesses, even if they're a sole proprietor, a sole entrepreneur, get into spaces, some an own, a space owner, a landlord, a commercial broker. So we're connecting these businesses in a different way that's a little bit different than the, than the P2P or, you know, think of it like the Airbnb, um, get around, relay rides, those sorts of companies of the world. Um, these, these businesses have a reputation to uphold. And so it means a lot to them to make sure that they're doing something that reflects well on their brand. So that can make things harder uh, because they, they hold us to high expectations, but it can also make things uh, much better uh, to help more businesses launch. And the real, the real difference, I think, here with Storefront and everyone else in the sharing economy is we're helping these businesses do more of what they love. These people are doing more of what they love. You may be driving an Uber but, and being able to you know, set your own hours, but you're not necessarily doing more of what you love. You may be driving that Uber so you can actually go to home and do more of your art. And so I think that's what's really impactful here. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen this, this is the Craigslist map just a portion of it, of all the marketplaces that are coming out of Craigslist. So I think it's an interesting thing to pull out in the sharing economy component because basically it's almost down the list that every single category on Craigslist is moving into a marketplace. And now there's even a layer being built on top of that where you have companies like Breeze, it lets you rent a car so you can drive Uber or Lyft, or Pillow, that allows you someone to manage your Airbnbs while you're away from town. So I think there's a lot, of, there's a lot more that's going to happen in the marketplace realm, although it's a very hard business to build, and I've had some of those conversations with, with some of the people here. Uh, it can be very rewarding because you're opening up a whole new world of business for people. You're distributing the power where maybe one large entity had it before, and now maybe a thousand or a million people have it. So the next economy of the three is the local economy. Uh, what's interesting about the local economy is we were thinking very global for a while. Uh, the internet it, what developed, we had all these new options uh, and ways to connect with people. But now we're, now we're turning back to our local communities and saying, I want to eat from a local farmer. I want to buy from a local craft maker. Um, and so part of that trend is like we're, we're through Storefront, we're helping bring those, those opportunities to people. Whereas maybe you had a doctor living in your apartment building and you had to go to the hospital emergency room, but really you could have just went next door. We think of that scenario like an artist. And what if, and what if that artist uh, or that designer is literally living in your apartment building and you didn't even know it? Uh, and now they actually have the opportunity to interact in your own community, in your own neighborhood. Fill up that vacant space that's down the block. Now you have a chance to meet that person and create a place where people gather and uh, you know, have a brand experience that actually helps the local economy. And these are actually these are two, uh, two people that have used Storefront to launch in a festival in San Francisco. Um, and then it brings us to the on-demand economy. We are, we've never been lazier as a humanity. Uh, we want everything to come to us. And if, for anyone who's been to San Francisco, you probably have a much better understanding of that. Uh, we have a, literally an app for about everything that will bring anything to us that we don't have to ever leave our home apartment. Um, in that same sense though, uh, looking at that trend and seeing where demand and customer demand is going, we're saying, hey, Storefront's doing that same thing for offline retail. 
going back to the local economy, we're, we're allowing a brand or a business owner to open up a store or a gallery or an experience in the physical world and bring it right to where their customers are so they don't have to leave their neighborhood or the area that they shop. And this brings me to the point that I'm really excited about, and I think everyone here should be really excited about as well, is the personal selling revolution. So, like I said, it's never been easier to start a business. Uh, this gets, this is, is, there's just so many tools out there, uh, from Square to do checkouts, or YouTube and Twitter for promotion, or Etsy or Shopify to open up an e-commerce store. It's, it's so, so easy. Pretty much every, everything and every part of the business that we used to have to run, there's now a service for that. Accounting, whatever. So it allows you to really focus on what you care the most about. And for us, the ma and for the makers, that's, that's really what they're driven by. They want to, they, they're driven by the craft, and they want to do more and more of this. Probably the same for most of us. You know, the craft of creating uh, a technology, an app, a business, figuring it out, the challenges, it's hard. But there's so much out there now. And getting close to the end here, still 95% of commerce is done offline in the US. It's about 85% in the UK. But I think we're seeing a merge of e-commerce and offline experiences come into one. There's some big buzzwords out there called multi-channel or omni-channel. But in the day, you're going to where your customer is, whether that's in the physical world, whether it's on the online world. And so that brings me to a big lesson six. Be passionate about what you do. Make things that really matter to you and to the people around you. It seems like a very obvious thing, but I think going back to uh, my namesake, Tristan Harris's talk, it really matters. It really matters to have that, that ethical design to really think about what value you are bringing to the world. It's been kind of a, a comedic joke in San Francisco about companies changing the world. Everyone's changing the world, but how are they changing it? And does changing actually equal good? So something to think about. But I think that at the end of the day, this is, this is really where what got me to these steps, just by doing things that I really care about. Say hello to me. That's my Twitter handle. And I'm happy to take your emails. Thank you. And I, and I could do a, few, a couple questions, too, if you, if you want to yeah. use a couple questions. I think we'll do a couple questions. That would be really neat. <laughs> because um, who has a question? Raise your hand. Don't be sissies. That's the one-off opportunity. Marvelous. There's the first question. Do we have a microphone? Here, right up front, please. And think of what I said about opportunity. So one of the things I always look at to see what the future could look like, where it could develop, is other places in the world where similar things are happening. And the thing that's always inspired me are the, the figures coming out of China. They've, they haven't done the mortar and brick thing at all, right? Uh, they can't build it at that scale. So everything's being sold through Taobao and all those kind of experiences. So the question I'm leading to is, what are the lessons you learned from that? Has that inspired you? Uh, do you see any analogies there of what we can use down here in the western part of the world? Could you, could you repeat the, last, the first part of the question? About, you said something about China? Yeah, so if you said 95% of retail is still done from modern brick stores. Mm -hmm. In China, that's not true because there are no modern brick stores and you can't build enough of them. So all the commerce there is e-commerce, Taobao and all those kind of marketplaces, right? What are the analogies you see between that and what you're doing and how can we combine those? Yeah, um, so I mean, I, there definitely is brick and mortar there, right? There's like the mega malls. It's just a little bit different. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's a, it's a great question, is that retail is an experience. Like, we're, humans are inevitably social. Um, we're sitting here in a room together. 
we're going to go out here and have drinks and talk to each other. We want those experiences. So in that same sense, uh, that's how I see everywhere in the world. And I see it as like s urban centers. So I think when you see these urban centers and you see a concentration of people, we need to continue to make spaces where people can interact. And that can be done in a, in a park, it could be done in an open space, it could be done in a brick and mortar store. Uh, it's just being smart about creating those experiences. And so I think big brands can do it, I think small brands can do it, but we'll still crave to go out and, and have, these, have these experiences. Thank you. Who else has a question? Marvelous. Right up front, please. Hang on, we'll just have to give you a mic. Sorry. You're stealing my mic, but okay. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> so, you. so many people want to start marketplaces. So, for young entrepreneurs and companies that want to start this, what's the process that they should go through in thinking about, is this the right market? Uh, what are the double sides? What are some of the economics I should look at? Things like that. Yeah. So... I mean, you're, you're probably better at asking, answering this question than me. <laughs> um, He's testing you. He's testing you. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing I always think about when, if you're like at the, if you have an idea and you want to turn that into a business, uh, even, you know, my experience is with the marketplace, but I think this applies to a lot of different types of businesses. Um, Dom, Dom says this a lot, but it's like about smoke tests. And it's about like, it's about starting like at the, bare, bare minimum. You don't even need to build a product. You can go, basically, like, through the storefront experience, I went out and I talked to people in the, in, the, in the street. I talked to store owners. I found friends and family that were trying to open up a short-term store and they would talk to 10 different, 20 different brokers, commercial brokers or real estate agents. Then they talked to 10 different insurance providers. And then they'd have to pay a premium for the space and rent it longer than they wanted to. And so we saw this repetitive thing over and over just by having those conversations. Um, we also saw some of those trends uh, and, you know, marketplaces like Airbnb and how they were tackling different issues and basically bringing trust and efficiency in between uh, very complex or old industries. And so that, that was kind of how we thought of it, and that was before we even had an MVP, um, if, MV, if MVPs are real, if anyone watched a lot of the panel before. Um, and through that process, you know, we built out like an MVP um, and then started to, and, then, and basically like, well, even before that, we had like a landing page and we just had email signups. We were like, who wants to rent short-term retail space? You know, we'll, we'll, you know, basically implying that we'll help you do it. So I think that those kind of like little, little steps building up to, uh, building up to what now has become, you know, a two-year-old business. Uh, is what really matters. Little iterations and really paying attention to what the actual problem is. Um, I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, there. Uh, when can you scale that far to reach this region? I was really happy, I mean, happy in a way to hear that uh, so many stores, so many places uh, also in San Francisco and the, and the States are empty because this is the thing that we see here in Maribor and Slovenia and the region, I'm, I bet in Croatia also. So when can we help our local owners and brands to, to make the change and to fill these empty spaces? Yeah, I would say don't wait. Uh, there's a couple of things here. There's two, two lessons, I guess. One, marketplaces are incredibly hard. Um, our investors want us to grow really, really fast but we're working with physical things, uh, you know, physical spaces in the real world. So it takes time to help people be confident that they do this and they meet their goals, whether they want to make sales, whether they want brand awareness. We, it, it's taken some time to help develop the industry. I think we came in at a good time. It's still developing because real estate's so old. Um, so we, I always get that question and uh, I wish Storefront was everywhere because uh, I want to make this easier, and I want to really support the creative class anywhere in the world, in any urban center, you know, even if it's a very small one. Um, the second part of it is don't wait. Uh, this is something that we're seeing ci or city urban advocates, uh, basically like local, basically someone saying, hey, I'm a local ambassador, or I want to be, I want to make, Far I have a friend in Fargo, and he's like, I want to make Fargo, North Dakota uh, the most exciting place to be. And so I'm seeing this, I'm seeing these people in cities across, across the country, and some of them may be so small 
but they're still doing it, and they're bringing these opportunities, and they're bringing interesting businesses, and they're finding the investors that care about what's actually happening on, on the streets of their city, and they're helping them connect with these small business owners, or they're changing laws to make things easier, or they're getting small business subsidies. So I think it's, it's go back to the MVP, and it's, it's probably as simple as approaching a, a store that has a, a landlord that owns a vacant space in the best part of town, and introducing them to your friend that's an artist or is running a brand or is doing a tech app and wants to demo it to people walking by. One short observation, maybe more than a question, if I may. Um, I'm really happy that to see that, I mean, you're a really successful guy. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, two years, but a lot of money for your project or product. Uh, but I, I know I'm noticing this friendliness and your personality and it shows me that uh, you don't have to be a big ego to show off on the stage but to be more personal and and humble uh, which is something really uh, different than usually thank, thank you, you very much for that observation that's the part where you make some noise please <laughs> and he's so right there's some Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.